We are recording the interview of Jimmy Butler. This interview is being conducted by David Barry from the Wright State University's Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at the Holiday Inn Hotel in Fairborn, Ohio. It is 3 p.m. on June 6, 2019. Uh, why don't we start with when and where were you born? I was born in a little shack in Oklahoma in July of 1941. Um, Pretty poor parents at that time, been to the depression and all that. So I uh, had a, one of my aunts was a midwife and had a doctor come to this little shack and was born then, summer 1941. And then uh, who were your parents and what did they do? My parents, my father was Howard H. Butler. He had been a farmer, not very successfully down in, down in Oklahoma during the depression and all. And, uh, at the beginning of World War II, he came up and got a job at Cessna Aircraft Company in Wichita, Kansas. He was some 4F or something and had to do with his feet, I think, as far as being drafted. So he worked at Cessna Aircraft Company for the next 32 years. There was a little fall off right after World War II when the market kind of went away, but uh, he worked with Boeing for a little while and then was called back to Cessna. <coughs> He was tool and die maker. He had about an eighth grade education. Tool and die worked regularly with trigonometry, so he had a good, good head for numbers and math and all, uh, but just didn't have the education. So that was my father. My mother was Hazel. Uh, she was from Oklahoma, pretty much a housewife. She kind of wanted to, wanted to uh, be a school teacher, but she ended up getting pregnant in those days and had my sister who was five years old and born in 1936. So when we came up to Kansas, she was basically taking care of us. We ended up settling in a little town, El Dorado, which was about 25 miles from where my father worked, so he was made that trip for 30 some years. And uh, actually during the war, she actually went to work at Beechcraft for a little while as kind of Rosie the Riveter type thing and my grandmother took care of us kids for a little bit, but something happened, I'm not quite sure what, made her feel like she didn't really want to stay away from what was going on where we were, so I don't know if it was some kind of threat or something, so she worked there until we got through pretty much into school, and, and she worked J.C. Penney's for 20-some years in Eldorado, Kansas. Uh, my father died in 1986. He had diabetes and a few things and uh, heart problems and then she lived till she was 87 years old and then finally died in 2004. My sister Jackie Sue, Jacqueline Sue, five years older, she was quite a character, uh, lived a fairly poor life most of the time. She uh, was a superb legal secretary from pretty young, but my brother-in-law through college and he worked part-time as a police officer in Wichita, and then she put him through law school up in Topeka. And while she was up there, she was the legal secretary for the head of the state senate. And uh, they ended up getting a divorce. He took a job out in western Kansas, which didn't really require her level of secretary, but he ended up getting uh, custody of the son, so she ended up moving out to Garden City, Kansas, away from Topeka. Uh, just before her boss became the governor of Kansas, so she would have been that had she stayed in Topeka. Uh, so she was top level there, lived fairly poor most of her life, but got involved out there with a registered nurse, I think it was, and the two of them put together a home health care agency for southwest Kansas. Ran that for a while, finally her partner moved to Colorado, so she had the whole business. Uh, Western Kansas stuff is expensive out there compared to Wichita, so uh, she didn't like what they were paying for uniforms, so she started a corporation, you know, limited liability corporation for uniforms. Durable medical equipment was expensive, so she, she uh, set up one of those businesses, she set up a hospice, so at the time of her death she was running about five companies. Um, when they sold out, well, there were a couple of hospitals tried to compete with her. They couldn't, couldn't. She had maybe 85 nurses working for her. And when she sold out the durable medical equipment to the hospital, it was had an inventory of something like $800,000. So she ended up rich, but she'd grown very, very poor. 
started smoking cigarettes early as was the, the thing back in the 40s and um, the only time I ever smoked was when she was 15. I was about 10, she gave it to me so I wouldn't tell on her and fortunately I didn't really take it up but smoking finally caught up with her and she died early at 62, um, which she'd still be around raising hell <laughs> if that hadn't happened. <clears throat> So what did you do before you joined the military? I was basically in high school, um, in a little town of Eldorado, Kansas, 11 or 12,000 people back when they taught reading, writing, arithmetic, and education was a much more personal thing with teachers, and uh, we had a uh, an old maid librarian over in the high school who, she set up what was she called her little scholarship club, and she had the uh, English teachers seventh and eighth grade identify kids that ought to compete for scholarships and so I was in a scholarship club when you had free time you went over and took tests in her in her library because she believed in kids being test wise and you know, the more you've taken the test the more when you're in there for the real thing I remember being at Wichita one time for some scholarship test and and I'd learned things about how to take fast how to check my answers and all this and I'm done with a few minutes left, and I look at the gal next to me, and she's filled in maybe, I don't know, 15 answers out of 100. And I'm thinking, you know, no sense coming here if you that was all you're going to do. Of course, sometimes they, they would take extra points off for misses, but, you know, we learned those kind of things as how to compete, and uh, there were a lot of scholarships that came in this little town. And I had a small scholarship to the University of Kansas through that, but in 1955 or so, I heard they were building the Air Force Academy, and I decided I would like to go to the Air Force Academy and become a pilot. Never been around airplanes. <laughs> well, my dad was Cessna, you know, I had pictures and you know, a propeller there, things like that. So I had some exposure, but I wasn't a natural pilot. I had a daughter who was a much more natural pilot than I ever was. And uh, so I wrote to the congressman, and. Oh, no, I don't think I was a sophomore, and I uh, uh, said I'd like to apply for an appointment at the academy because each congressman could appoint one person, and each senator, and, uh, and I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, which started in Denver and was being built down near Colorado Springs, and uh, so I got a letter back from him that says, hey, Sonny, I've got another election between now and then, you know, talk to me later, but he was a friend, a boyhood friend of the editor of our local newspaper. And so when it finally got closer time, my newspaper editor, I think, helped get some attention to him. Uh, started getting telegrams, okay, you need to come to Wichita for some more tests, and then later you need to go to Oklahoma City for a physical. And uh, <laughs> My mother was not crazy about this at all. You know, her attitude was, I, don't, I didn't raise you to fly airplanes and get killed. You know, I'm saying, no, that's not what it's all about, but anyway, finally, you know, about about a month before in May, maybe I get to telegraph grandma said I had the appointment. <laughs> she wasn't quite sure what to do. All her friends were so thrilled, <laughs> and she never did sign for me. I was 17 when I went out, so my dad signed for me. So, you know, within a month after leaving high school, I was off the Air Force Academy in the class of 1963, the fifth class that graduated to the academy. And we actually started at the Air Force Academy site the first couple of years they'd been up in Denver and and the class ahead of us had had their summer training in Denver and then came down for academics so that the, the first graduating class of 59 they got to spend one year down at the site but we were the first ones to actually start there and have our summer training so wasn't much between high school and uh, going off the Air Force Academy. So when you got the uh, when you got to the Air Force Academy, how was that? Was it a, a shock or? Well, you knew what to expect. I'd seen an article a year or so earlier about what they called beast barracks at, at West Point, where the, you knew the summer was going to be tough. And uh, but that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I was surprised that some of the upperclassmen would say, "Oh, you just came out here for the education." And I didn't, but that's what drew a lot of people. It was a top flight education. Very, very competitive in the early years for, we had 750 in our class. We were gonna be the first full-size class. 
think the first class started with 200 up in Denver and then 300 in the next one and the class right ahead of us was 450. We started with 750 and we're gonna be the first one although they've had classes since then. They built another dormitory and they've had classes entering with more than a thousand and graduating. This one that graduated just this last week where President Trump was out there and shook every hand. Uh, they were 990 that they graduated. We graduated 500 out of the 750, so it was about a 30% or 33% attrition rate. So it was a, it was a tough school. Uh, summer training was tough. <coughs> a lot of, I'm uh, just talking to one of the fellows out there that's working a training program for at-risk youth. He's been a former police officer. And then their first couple of weeks is kind of a tough shock thing. And, uh, and I was telling him, well, you learn you can do more push-ups than you thought you could have when somebody's yelling at you. And, uh, I was telling him when I did the processing and you could hear all the noise outside of the guys who were ahead of you. And, and the last lady says, well, go out that door and you probably should run. So I go running out there and there's a guy in the starch khakis waiting for me. And, and uh, I was telling my friend, and he says, okay, line up your toes with that line. So I did, who told you to look down? So I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be interesting, and it was what I wanted to do, and I stuck through things that most people wouldn't have thought I could have done, you know, to, but that was my goal. And and right before I went out, they, I finally took an airplane ride because they had one of these penny a pound things for the March of Dimes out at the airport, and you could, if you weighed 150 pounds for a buck and a half, it took you around a little bit, and so that was my first time in an airplane, but I'd already had my appointment, so. Was, I wasn't a great pilot initially, but you know, persevered. Uh, so, when you were done with the academy, were you already a trained pilot, or did you have to go to more schooling after that? Yeah, you know, you had to go to regular undergraduate pilot training in the Air Force. A lot of people assumed you flew out of the academy. Now they have a airfield there. And they used to have some trainers there to at least get an orientation, maybe enough to get a private license for 14 or 15 hours to solo. But I moved there in 91, and within the first couple of years, three of those planes crashed with an instructor and a cadet aboard. And they decided that kind of airplane had some kind of problems that they couldn't deal with. So I think now they take them down to Pueblo and maybe get them a flight orientation, and they do soaring at the academy that I live just south of it and there's always planes pulling up gliders and and they've got quite a parachuting team there so the airfield is used but you don't we didn't get any the the first two or three classes they became navigators they started out up in Denver where they had the navigator school so they were qualified navigators when they graduated but that wasn't really the, the objective so they did we had a navigation orientation but we didn't get wings on that so you go down to <coughs> Pardon me, one of um, eight different pilot training bases at that time. I chose Enid, Oklahoma because that was fairly close to where I grew up and I thought I may never have a chance to be this close again ever in my career. So it was 13 months. You fly, back then you flew a T 37 for about six months and then you flew a, on a supersonic trainer, the T 38, and had just been introduced there in 1963, 64 time frame. So, you get about 220 hours of flying, and uh, and you graduate as as a basic pilot, uh, and then go off to your first assignment. So, what was your first assignment? First assignment, I I chose the military airlift command because I'd I'd had a problem one day in pilot training, and I'd kind of lost a lot of my confidence as far as being a flyer. And I thought, well, you get out there, you'll be a co-pilot for a while, and you kind of come on. So that was kind of my choice. Um, in pilot training, they gave out choices based on what your standing was in the class. And we started out with 45 guys and, and ended up graduating 38. They had three different things, academics, basically officership, and uh, flying. <laughs> and so flying, I was about the middle of the class. I wasn't really, I mean, we had some really good pilots there, which wasn't me. Uh, but in academics, I ended up third, and I ended up number one in officer training for some of the leadership things I did in our classes. We were starting to lose people at the beginning, and so that put me up. I think I got to pick number three, where you know if I'd have been picking on my middle of the middle of the class as far as flying, you know, I wouldn't have got, I wouldn't have had that choice. But 
I chose C-135s, which were a long-range jet transport flying out of the West Coast. At that time, there was one squadron of them there and two squadrons in New Jersey. But the Vietnam War was starting to kick up, so there was a lot of stuff going across the Pacific. And then when they brought in the C-141, which was the next big long-range airlifter designed to be a military airlifter, uh, ours was the first squadron to get them, so we went through the growing pains of starting to fly those operational. Went down to Oklahoma City at Tinker Air Force Base for the upgrade training and a few flights on that. And I came back to California, and there were a hundred of us qualified pilots in the C-141, and we had two airplanes. So it was a long time before the first lieutenants got to do much flying, and. When they finally got around to us, finally getting to start working, the Vietnam War was overtaking us. So uh, I was just a first pilot by the time in the fall of 66. I said, hey, if you get a forward air controller slot, I will take it. And it turned out I would have probably been caught on it anyway in the next group that came down. But lots of pilots were being pulled out of the military airlift command to go fill slots in Southeast Asia. So I was at Travis for a couple of years after going to survival school. You had that on the way. Um, from Travis, October 66, I went down to Florida to Eglin Air Force Base, and actually the facts were trained at the Hurlburt Auxiliary uh, Base right there, and learned how to fly a little Cessna. <clears throat> and it was a little bit of a challenge because the Cessna is a tail dragger. It's got the, wheel, the tail wheel in the back like Piper Cubs you'd see out at any normal airplane or air bay, airfield back then. But it's a little more of a challenge because with the tail wheel in the back, if it starts swinging on you, the more it swings, the more it wants to swing, to where it's not uh, naturally uh, going to come back. If it, if you get the nose wheel, well, maybe you've done some of those. If the nose wheel gets out, it tries to correct itself. The tail wheel tries to make it more. So. Uh, before I got to my base in Thailand, I saw a chart on the wall. It was late January, and I said. We'd already lost two airplanes over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, it didn't say that at the time, but that's what I learned. And we'd had two crash land at the base, and they'd basically done ground loops so that I'd get away from them. And when it starts twisting, it usually twists the tail off because it's just not designed to take the sideward loads. So um, that took some training down at, at Hurlburt to kind of. In fact, the, the first day I'm thinking, am I going to really make it through? Because the first time I tried to land, the, the guy didn't demonstrate a landing first. Probably should have. Well, I had about a thousand hours expected me. <laughs> but I had not flown, and when I flew in a C-141, when the, when the wheels touch down, you're way up in the air yet. A little while, because just the angle of the plane. <laughs> so first time I came in to land, I kind of started rounding out about that high above the ground, and that wasn't going to work. You know, of course, he took it before he hit the ground, and I was starting to wonder, but as it went on, I finally learned a little more, but, but you had to work to, to learn to work the little plane on the ground, and then we had to learn the basic things of being forward air controllers, of being flying small aircraft and directing fighters and bombers, and maybe in your time in, in Southwest Asia, you got to see a little bit of that, although it's mostly ground people that do directions now, where we're doing from the air back when it could be permissive enough to fly at 80 knots. And, where we flew over the trail was not a place permissive for 80 knots. So that's part of what went on over there. So from uh, left Christmas Day on 1966 to drive back to Travis, California, at a port call date of the 20th of January, which was Super Bowl Sunday for I think the second Super Bowl, something like that, in 67. And, uh, I had no idea where I was going except I was going to be a forward con air controller I expected in South Vietnam because they had four squadrons in South Vietnam, one for each core group, and that's where most facts went to. But the Air Force had an agreement with the Army that says, we will provide you at maybe battalion level or above, some, some level, we will give you a forward air controller as fighter pilot background. They thought that's what you needed to direct airstrikes and close air support. So I didn't have fighter pilot background. I'd been to MAC. In fact, some of the guys that got assignments the same time I did, they sent them to F-100 school to check out in fighters, fly that just a little bit, and then so they could be a ground fac 
with the Army because they had the fighter pilot score film. So I get there and the, the group headquarters was at Benoit Air Force Base near Saigon. And we go in there and there's a chart on the wall about all five squadrons and, and the guy says, well, you're going to go to Thailand and we can't tell you anything about it. So I didn't know what that, you know, had no idea really what to expect because I thought I'd be going in country someplace. Went down for about a week or so down to Bintui because they wanted to put us back in the airplane a little bit because we hadn't been in the airplane for six weeks and didn't want us wrecking our little airplanes over there. So we went down to Bintui and do four or five rides. It's kind of a theater indoctrination. And down there, one of the, the guy who was running it had been a pilot at Nakom Panom in Thailand. And so he could tell us a little bit, but he says, you're not going to learn about it until you go over there. So nobody could really tell us what that was going to be about. <clears throat> Came back up, flew over to Bangkok, spent two or three days there, and then got on a shuttle. There was a C-130 shuttle that ran around Bangkok, or about Thailand, every day. One day it'd go one way and one day it'd go the other, to stop at the main air bases, Ubon, NKP, Udorn, Takli, and Karat. And uh, so we got on the shuttle and went to NKP. Well, we got there and and when I was looking at that chart, I'm a numbers guy, I'm looking at the chart and saying, we're not even done with January yet. It says there's supposed to be 48 pilots in the squadron, there's about 40. And the month isn't over yet, and you've already had two combat losses, and you've had two crashes. So I'm saying 12 months, 48, divide that for a month, there's going to be something for everybody. Sounded like, and we're kind of joking about this. And we got to NKP on the 7th of February, and they lost another fact the day before. And the helicopter that picked him up also got shot down. So this guy got shot down twice that day, and it was a pretty grim time to, to arrive there. <coughs> there was a squadron pilots meeting that night, and there was a lot going on because they were still flying over concentrated anti-aircraft artillery in a Cessna at about the altitude you're flying over small arms automatic weapons in South Vietnam. So he decided that has to change, even though the lower you are, the more you can see. And they decided there was so much 37 millimeter anti aircraft artillery along the trail, and supposedly its effective range was 5,600 feet. So he said, and that's from the barrel of the gun, basically. So he said, okay, we'll start flying. We flew in pairs with this little Cessna because you were out a long ways. If you went down, nobody would have a clue. And. Uh, so the bottom guy would fly about 5,500 and the other guy would fly at 6,000. And that's the way we started working it, which cut down our losses, but you couldn't see nearly as well, use binoculars. And, uh, and so we actually we didn't lose anybody while I was there. But uh, so daytime it was mainly <clears throat> patrolling roads and keeping them off the roads. Um, I remember seeing that the highway of death in that first Gulf War you know, when they all started trying to get out of Kuwait and just got ripped. And uh, that was the type of thing that, you know, facts would get involved with. And of course the A-10s, I think, were there by then. Uh, but it turned out most of our job in the daytime was basically patrolling empty roads because we were keeping them off the roads. Now if the weather came in, out they'd come. Uh, and we were taught immediately, don't fly below undercast or overcast where they can shoot at you for free and you can't get fighters back in on them. So they got out on the daytime when they could, but most of the time we kept them off. So if you imagine, I tell people when I'm in Colorado, you got you pass there, so imagine you want to drive you pass under those conditions, you're going to be driving with, well, dirt roads, uh, no guardrails, no center line. If the moon is out, you don't drive with your lights on because there's enough moon to tell where the roads were, and those guys, I think, they drove 25, 30 mile sectors, so they knew kind of what their road was like. And you're trying to drive mountain roads, in some cases, doing this. Um, and then every so often, a flare goes off, and there's somebody up there going to come at you. So by forcing them into that, they couldn't be nearly as efficient was that they had the free run of the roads like they had before the forward air controllers started showing up. So I did fly a month of nights in November and that was the wild time. And I don't think we have anybody here that flew nights. Well, no, probably not that much, but 
you know, the guys who flew a year of nights over there, that was a tough tour. And we had some navigators in our squadron that did because they used the starlight scopes and then we were controlling propeller-driven fighter bombers, old T-28s, A-26s, and their whole tour was nights. And it was, that was when the real action was, was night over the trail. Now, was your aircraft, was it solely for reconnaissance or did it have uh, combat means as well? The O-1s and the O-2s were basically unarmed. We did have marking rockets to mark the targets, the white phosphorus that you know, if you hit somebody with a white phosphorus rocket, they were going to die. But basically, we were unarmed, essentially. We had an M16, had the pistol and all that. And I had a lot of bullets, and I had more and more bullets in my little bag the longer I flew. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, when we got the O2s, that was essentially a Cessna, 337 Skymaster, a civilian airplane where they had a pusher puller. They had an engine on the front and they had an engine on the back. Cessna designed those. I know a little more about Cessna because I was around there. My dad was involved. But the Cessna 310 was an airplane like Sky King with a wing, with an engine out on each wing, and a lot of civilian pilots couldn't handle it if you lost an engine because you got the yaw and you got to keep it from going where the the other engine wants to go. So they decided if we build an airplane where both of the engines are on the center line, you get rid of the yaw problem if one of them dies, an engine dies, so your, your civilians have a better chance of getting down safe. So that's what that airplane had been put together for. They were gonna replace FAX with the OV-10 Bronco, which was an armed airplane, although they didn't let the FAX fly them armed a lot because they didn't want FAX playing fighter pilot and getting killed but they had a capability of carrying some armaments. We basically had marking rockets, we had more of them in the O2, and you could put flechette warhead rockets, I don't know if you're familiar with those, all the little, little darts in the nose cone, so we could fire those, but you didn't really have anything to fire them at. So basically we were unarmed with the marking rockets. A little bit of a problem is basically, well, the OV-10 was gonna come in and solve all this, except the OV-10 was one of McNamara's Department of Defense. Hey, if we design one airplane and everybody flies it, then we can do it more cheaply. You know, so they said, we're going to have the LORA long light attack reconnaissance airplane. That's what the OV-10 started as. And gee, we can set it up so the Marines can use it, the Navy can have it on the carriers, the Air Force can use it, and I don't know if the Army was going to get here or not. And during that process, they said on a carrier, the elevators are this wide. So most of the time you see the airplanes with their, you know, in World War II, the wings always came up. But they said, you know, with the OV-10, if you don't make the wings too big, you can go up and down on the carrier for the Navy and not have to have a folding wing. Which well, sounds like a good concept. But it turned out the OV-10 had these really powerful turboprop engines on them. Just really powerful. And because of the short wings, the ailerons to control that, weren't far enough out that if you lost an engine on takeoff, there was about a four knot range that you could be airborne. And if you lost an engine, you were below what we called air minimum control speed. If you pulled one engine back, you either had to pull the other one back or you're gonna roll into the ground. So they said, hmm, we don't clear airplanes like that. They had to redesign the airplane to put the ailerons out farther and solve that problem. In the meantime, we were losing an O-1 a week, pretty much in Southeast Asia, so they went to Cessna, got the O-2, painted it colors, they ended up putting some extra win windows on the right side by the door, because when you're sitting in the left seat, you had to look across the cockpit, you couldn't see very well, so they put a lowered window there. You couldn't throw, hang or throw smoke bombs out, well, they had a little bitty, kind of like the wing on your car. If you open that, you could maybe get the smoke bomb out of it. Uh, and in some ways, the O-1 was a better reconnaissance airplane because you could look at either side, you didn't have to set up a pattern, which almost got me killed one night by violating one of the rules and going over on the moon side of the road because I didn't want to waste 40 minutes to go fly down in the dark and come back up again. I got caught against the full moon with a serious background. Well, then it was like I was flying in the daytime and they were on us. <laughs> 
because we flew lower at night. I flew about 3,500 feet at night or instead of 55, and I didn't fly. I flew more straight lines. We learned early when we showed up after just losing the three guys that one of the rules was when you're out over the guns in the daytime, you don't fly more than 10 seconds in a straight line. So if you're riding with me, I'm probably going to get you sick because <laughs> when you're the pilot, you handle that. When you're sitting there in the back, especially in the 01, it was not a comfortable place in the back, you were probably going to get sick. I took an A1 pilot out one night or one morning to try to find his wingman who some ordnance had blown part of his wing off the night before when it went hot on the wing and uh, uh, we were out there looking around and, and they burn off the, the rice fields in the springtime so it was, we were out there in the smoke and uh, we got back and he said, he was an A1 pilot, he says, I've never been sick in an airplane in my life, but you know, you just, when you're doing that with no real outside references anyway, um, but the O2, with the O1, you could go out one side, and if you're looking with a starlight scope, you look there, you turn around, and he looks out this window, so you don't have to get over on the moon side. And uh, uh, it was great having the O2 had had uh, TACAN, which was a navigation system. The O1, we were map readers. We had no real navigation. There was an old automatic direction fighter, ADF, kind of old, old technology that was supposed to point to a ground station and didn't give you any distance or anything, but it could tell you if it was out there or behind you or where it was. And unfortunately, they pointed most often to nearest thunderstorm, so I never paid attention to the ADF at all. Um, so we were map readers. One of the funny stories was after we lost our guy up in Mugia Pass, which was a very dangerous place, they started saying, well, how do we get a FAC mission in without little Cessnas? And they said, could you do the FAC mission from the back seat of an F-4? Now, our maps, and I've got maps out there to show, we used one to 60,000 scale maps. You may have used something like that on the ground. And so we could we could get down pretty close to what the real coordinates were, except you haven't figured out this in the jungle and the terrain and all this. But could you do that in the back of an F-4 going so fast? and? And so a couple of our experienced facts went down to Ubon, the major F-4 base, in uh, about March. And <laughs> they came back about two weeks later, and, and I've got maps out there. If you want to ever come out and take a look, I can show you more, but I've got maps of our target area. And our intel people, we had a TACAN station at NKP Channel 89, so they would have our maps marked up with radials and circles for DME. And that's what we used as facts because when the Airborne Command Post was going to send us a set of fighters, they needed to tell them where to come. So I could look at my map and I say, okay, I'm about the 095 radial at 75 miles from NKP. They'd come. You know, once they got close, we'd fight each other and go do the strike. And these guys came back from Ubon and they said, well, the, the fighter pilots down there said the best kept secret of the war is that the facts don't have attack in because they had believed all the time we were reading off our tack in to tell them where to come. But that was just one of the, the things we had to use. Got a real problem if you tried to go fly nights in the 01, and we were starting to try to develop a night program to be night facts over the trail. While we still had the 01s, my roommate got in on that, some of the more experienced guys did. And, uh, well, probably, probably Iraq and Afghanistan side would be similar. I mean, out there in the jungle in the dark, it's dark. There weren't a bunch of lights. And now, if, uh, I used to compare it. We'd go out in NKP, go 75 or 80 miles, and you were going to run into the trail. A little like flying from Hawaii to California. You eventually were going to find California. Now, you, you know, once I saw the trail, I, could, I knew where I was. And then you'd go to your sector. But at the end, you got to fly back to Hawaii. And now you're going back over pure darkness. There wasn't much to identify the airfield was going to be across the river. And it was very, very risky. We had one plane that got back to the river and couldn't see the airfield anywhere. But they'd put a little marker beacon, radar marker beacon, to help the radar guys see us because the old one was not much more than ground clutter on the radars. And so they couldn't pick him up until he got the river. And when he told me he's at the river, they started really paying attention. And they uh, discovered he was about 50 miles on the other side of the base from where he thought he was. So basically, they saved that airplane by 
being able to vector him back towards the base. So some pretty risky stuff happened. My roommate did this. I've, I've written a novel about over this, and in the, in the book, one of the characters is doing this kind of thing, and he wakes up in the middle of the night saying, hey, hey, where the hell are we? That was my roommate. I don't attribute to the thing, but you know that was the kind of difficulty it was in an O1. Well, now in the O2, you had your attack in, so you could find your way home very readily, and uh, so night missions weren't nearly as difficult, but again, they were more risky to decide to go on the moon side of the road and stay low. Was uh, was the O2 then your favorite aircraft, or? Well, you lacked it because you had two engines. The O1, if you took a hit, you were gonna go down probably. O2, you had a chance of getting it back because you had a second engine. I lost one one day. Supposedly, you got 60% of the thrust out of the, out of the uh, rear engine and 40% out of the front, but I lost the front engine. I didn't I didn't feather it. When you feather it, you turn the prop into the wind and then it's less drag. When I was about 100 miles out, I had to cross the trail and I kept the engine running. It was just running rough and I apparently had fouled out the plugs. I'd gone down under the clouds to see if we could get one of these special missions in that these VO67 guys, one of them is getting interviewed now, I think, the, the guy who was standing there I was talking to. And I was mission commander, and could I take this big OP-2E, three facts, and some F-4s, go down under the clouds and get the mission in because the Pentagon wanted the missions in. That's a whole thing about the sensors along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You folks probably had a lot of sensors. That was new stuff over there then. And they'd invested a billion dollars to try to get this electronic wall to slow down interdiction or slow down infiltration and they couldn't couldn't get the money to pay off till the sensors were in. So we, we had a lot of pressure with the with the guys in BO67 to get those in. And uh, um, I don't remember what was your original question on that. Because there was something. Oh, uh, I believe it was which was your favorite aircraft. Oh. <clears throat> so it was nice to have the extra engine, but in some ways the old one was a better airplane for reconnaissance. It was a 1950s, was designed in 50 for the Korean War, and so it was very good for that. It was a rugged little airplane, could be out of a lot of the operating locations in South Vietnam. We had all ours at NKP, which seemed like a pretty remote base at the time, but uh, certainly better than the conditions. I went to Quezon for two weeks, and you know they had their airplanes parked down in a pit that had been bulldozed out, and you had a little bit of PSP, the metal matting to climb back up to the level of the runway. You flew, you came, put it back down in there. No no maintenance facilities at all. So if they had a real maintenance, take the airplane down to uh, Da Nang to their headquarters and work it. So, but it was a good little rugged airplane for that kind of thing. And, uh, so I, I liked it in some ways better, but it was good having the two engines and that kind of, But you could not, you could not do visual reconnaissance as well. I mean, I'm going to show a picture of my briefing tomorrow night. <clears throat> There's the old one flying. The wheels are down because the wheels didn't come up. And it'd be very, very hot, not as hot as where you were, but it'd be hot and muggy, and you're out there getting the plane started, and it's been in the sun, and you finally get airborne. And <laughs> what you do is you open up the windows, put your fingers in your flight suit arm, put your arm out the window to get a little air coming through. So, and, and when we started doing, of course, this was the O2, we started doing the... Uh, guys with scope operators, they had their wind out and they would be leaning out of the airplane with their scope to try to find the trucks. But the O-1, you could do that out of either side, and the O-2, you just didn't see a lot. When I was flying at night, I did about 25 missions, one of the windows that Cessna put in was just in front of the door, and it was right by the navigator's feet. So that's what I watched, because for us to do any business, he had to have the road on his side to find. Once we started, then. Got, I pretty much took over at that point, but he had to get us started and had to tell me where to put the strike down. <coughs> and we often had a T-28 right there with us, which is also our base. An old trainer that had been converted for air commando stuff with bombs and rockets and flares. So <coughs> we can have a strike going within about a minute or so of him telling me where the trucks were. And if you try to put F-4s in like that, you couldn't even get 
set up with them in the dark because they were way up higher, but this guy was with us. So he was right there, and sometimes we had to flash our beacon because he's there trying to keep us in sight in a black airplane roaming all around. But we made it work. And uh, But the navigator could be out the window there, but sitting on the pilot side, there was very little you could do other than look out your side. And But I watched that window, and if that window would start glowing red, and that told me tracers were in the air, and, and generally my approach was a hard, hard left turn. And I don't know how about your experience, but at night out there, you got where your reflexes were triggered by light. <laughs> and you basically had light, impact, or noise. But the light would get you. If, if the guy with you wanted to smoke a cigarette, he would tell you before he lit off his lighter, it's <laughs> not we're going to go that way. And one time I was looking out that window, and usually everything's dark, and all of a sudden there's the flashes and the tracers start coming up. And I was looking out of that window when they started firing, and I saw the first three shells come out, and they kind of formed a triangle and stopped. Now, if you've been around aviation, if you see an airplane out there and you kind of go on this way, if it stay in the same place, you're on pretty much collision course. I mean, you're going to be very close to each other when you get where the two of you converge. Well, I saw these three, and I'm thinking, they're coming up pretty close to converging at us. And now, if I'd ever been in watching the others that got close to us, it might have looked the same. <coughs> but to me, the thing's kind of interesting. I never saw the fourth tracer, which was half a second, three quarters of a second after the first one, because we were already starting a hard roll to the left. And I'd roll us 135 degrees of bank, you know, not quite on our back, but over there in the dark. You know, but that was a quick way to be different because it was going to take them about three seconds to get to you, and if they really had a good beat on you, you could you could deviate some from the path. And I just feel sorry for the navigators. He's looking down, looking trying to find trucks, and all of a sudden he's looking up the sky because you don't say, "Hey, I'm about to turn." So, so that having that little window made some difference at night. So were you doing a, a mission then almost every day, or even maybe even twice a day? Seldom twice a day. Normally in the, in the old one bird dog, we had about a three hour mission. It took us about an hour to get out to the trail and 80 knots say. Had about an hour with the trail and about an hour to come home to NKP. I've done three and 315 to three and a half, but you're pretty much out of gas if you go three and a half. Now with the O2s, I've flown a couple missions, two or three over five hours, because it hadn't. It was faster to get out there, and we could do a lot more business than the time we had. Uh, <coughs> the schedule for the for the FAC pilots was well, work schedule over there. Of course, you're talking a lot of the other guys. They were doing seven days a week loading airplanes and doing all the stuff they had to do. Our pilot schedule was basically a six day week and one day off, but one day off in NKP wasn't that helpful. So our squadron was already flying a duty cycle of 24 days on and six, four days off, which meant on the 24th day they could schedule the, for the early morning flight. We had blanket travel orders as fax, so if they came walking in here and said, we need you to go there now, it wasn't a matter of going down to personnel and getting orders made up. So we had our orders and they would let us use them to go down to Bangkok. So a lot of guys went down to Bangkok almost every month for four days and ride back up on that, on that fourth day, well, the fifth day, because you got four off after that morning. So uh, in that 24-day cycle, initially, we were supposed to have 48 pilots, and we had about 40. Three or four of us came in together, so we helped get them back up to Manning. <coughs> but you were going to get time off and all, so we were flying 32 sorties a day, which was 16 pairs of two airplanes. So you got 32 a day going with 38 and 39 pilots and some time off. So there were days you'd have two. So you'd come fly your three hours, take a little break or something, grab some lunch, and go back out again for another three. Uh, as Manning got better, that didn't happen as much later. And in the O2s, we normally had just one a day. I spent two weeks at Quezon in the summer of 67 when the trail was closed down by the monsoon. North Vietnamese told the villagers, hey, we'll be back in October, you know, because they really couldn't keep it open with the heavy, heavy rains. And uh, so we went to Quezon. We didn't have much to do. We had a little operation not too far from the base that I worked some. 
but uh, uh, the time we were over there, one day I flew four missions, but partly as I took off once and I got an oil, I forget what they called the light, but it was a light that indicated you may have iron filings in your oil pan, which may mean the engine is starting to eat itself and you need to get down. So I had one five minute mission, but every takeoff and landing was a was a mission. So so I did four over there. Uh, they weren't necessarily that long because you didn't have to go very far to, before you could do something. Uh, so, but but it was fairly heavy schedule. And then after I'd been there for six weeks, when I'd been over at Travis, I'd been a part time admin officer because, like I said, we had hundred pilots in the airplane, two airplanes, and there wasn't a lot of sunbathing and stuff the guys were doing because there wasn't any flying to do. And uh, the guys that were the execs had seen me down at the school where I wasn't a very good flyer, but I was a good student and it helped one of the Navy grads get through some of the testing. So they said, normally you never have a pilot being the admin officer. You had two guys that would trade off two weeks at a time because there's so much the pilots still have to learn when they get to an operational squadron. They've got to learn a lot of things about the airplane. And, and of course, being worldwide missions, there was a lot where the navigators they can go from plane to plane. There's some difference in the in electronics, but generally it's the same job. So, so they decided uh, maybe I could be the admin officer, and and then it turned out I was usually about three weeks a month because I would have my two weeks. I would go out and get a flight, come back in a week or so, and there wasn't going to be another flight for me and here the navigators were short so they needed their navigator back if they could get him off so he'd spend usually about a week in there while I was flying and then but I learned a lot being a being an admin officer I I got a very early promotion later and partly was from the things that I had learned about management a whole bunch of things and so I get over there and you know they don't have by playing admin officer and and so about four or five weeks into it, I went to squadron commander and I said, hey, I've got some experience that I, you know, I'd like to volunteer to be the admin officer when I'm not flying. <laughs> I think he didn't hear me saying when I'm not flying. I think his first thought was I didn't want to fly, so I'll be your admin officer, but no, I was going to do that. So so in a, in a week, seven days, if you flew seven missions, that's 20, getting towards 25 hours, 20 to 25. Plus, you have about an hour before to go get the briefing, go get your personal equipment, go get the airplane ready, and about 45 minutes or so for debriefing afterwards. So, flying was taking 30 or so hours a, a, a week, and I would spend another 30 or so playing admin officer. So, time went by very quickly. Um, and one of the awards I have, I got a bronze star there that was really for groundwork. And they normally didn't give pilots bronze stars unless. It was something for valor or bravery or something, but somebody decided that I should have something for that extra time I put in. But it made the tour go very fast, and so uh, that was part of my experience there. So how long did you actually end up being deployed to Thailand? <clears throat> well, there were basically one-year tours, and by the time we got there, we left on the 20th of January, so that meant our port call date could be as late as 20 January to come back. Um, and by the time I got up there, we'd taken about a week and a half to two weeks, plus a little hanging out in Bangkok. So got there the 7th of February, came home on the 5th of January, so I basically had about 11 months there. But I was telling some of the people that Laos didn't f count for the war. It's all a secret war at that point. It was not in the combat zone. That line was Vietnam. North and South Vietnam, some off the coast for the Navy to get credit there for combat tours. I could fly 25 missions a month in Laos, and I didn't qualify for combat pay at that point unless I went over in North Vietnam. So we had our the little Cessnas were going a lot farther in North Vietnam when I first got there, but <clears throat> we had a general that didn't want propeller airplanes in North Vietnam, so <coughs> we cut back about the middle of the year after we lost the T-28 over there with a couple of people. And, so we would get scheduled for at least one mission a month to go to North Vietnam. There were no truces in Laos. When you had a seven-day truce, three-day truce, 24-hour truce in Vietnam, <coughs> the stuff stopped over there, but in Laos, it was still our war. You know, I'd say, well, does that count if you get killed in Laos during a truce? Uh, an interesting aspect of this was 
In December of 67, there was a 24-hour Christmas truce. It started at 6 p.m. local time on Christmas Eve and ran to 6 p.m. local time Christmas night. I was pretty experienced fact by then. Uh, our normal procedure was when you crossed the river, which was about 10 miles east of base, you called the airborne controller and say, okay, nail one, two, and five, four crossing the fence. <coughs> that meant now they were kind of flight following you and, and if something happened, they were ones likely to hear from somebody else about it. But the North Vietnamese monitor air communications. So I used to say, well, it's almost like the guy says, okay, the, the fax can be here in 35 minutes, so tell Nguyen to have his crew off the road in 30. You know, they responded to things we said on the radio. So I stopped crossing, calling, making my call. If I had a morning flight, you know, I was over there trying to see what I could find before they all got hidden in the truck parks and uh, tried to surprise people. Well, on Christmas Eve morning, I had Sector 12, which was one of the main target areas with a place called the Bandle Boy Ford, which was one of the three most heavily defended places in Laos, and by the end of the war it was called the most bombed out place on the face of the earth, because it had a lot. When the, when the bombing halt started in North Vietnam, the air war against trucks moved into Laos fully. And so I got distracted by a truck, and I, I wrote this in the novel part to let that be intentional, but there was a truck there and it was an A-26 that hadn't gone home yet, we tried to get it and didn't, but I lost about 15 minutes there. When I got the Bandle Boy Ford, there was a line of trucks. There was a big, long grade to get up from it. On this side, it wasn't steep, but he had to go quite a ways. Good target area, very heavily defended. And there were trucks that just finished crossing the road and all lined up on that, on that grade. What, you know, I start putting this together later is they were taking every truck they could get out of Laos into North Vietnam. Now, they were going to risk them during that run but they were going to have 24 hours free in North Vietnam to get them someplace, get them fully loaded, and get them heading back towards the border. And a point I make, which is an important thing to, I think, about war, and you may run into some of this, <coughs> where you were, President Johnson would agree to these truces in a hope to maybe bring peace and end the war. North Vietnamese used the truces to win the war. There's a difference. So anyway. <laughs> Turned out there's a 12-hour airborne command post, alley cat at night, cricket in the daytime, and they were having their transition. You know, alley cats briefing cricket on everything we did at night, and the North Vietnamese were writing it down. I'm sure where they were, and so couldn't get on the radio right away. So I start falling, going, see how long a line of trucks I had. The Bandle Boy Ford was about eight miles or so from North Vietnam, crooked roads. The line was all the way into North Vietnam. In North Vietnam, the clouds were about maybe three miles of, of roadways before it got under the clouds. <coughs> the trucks were all there. I mean, I had a maybe 10 mile line of trucks, like a convoy, very evenly, closely spaced. Lots and lots of trucks. So I finally just got a, called on the guard frequency and says, okay, cricket, I need some air ordnance. You know, I've got more trucks than I've ever seen. And the, the clouds, depending on what they were going to do. And it turned out, unfortunately, it came our way. So there weren't any planes available initially. 30 minutes later, I had seven flights of fighters, but I didn't have any trucks anymore because they were covered. So I'm killing time while I'm waiting. And I go up as far as the front lines I could, and I fired a couple of marking rockets down, but they weren't going to stop, and I wouldn't have either because they were getting out of the cloud. But, um, I thought had those clouds gone the other way, you'd have read about it in the States because we would have had a turkey shoot. It wouldn't, wouldn't have been quite the road to death, but there would have been a lot of trucks scattered over a long ways because once you got across the border, it wasn't very heavily defended because we weren't going over there anymore. There weren't a lot of places, there was less jungle over there, so there weren't as many places to get them off the road and hide. They didn't have a bunch of truck parks set for that contingency. And <clears throat> Back in May, I'd had a flight of F-105s come in on a target. I used to work some with ground teams. I'd have Laotian with me or, or a Thai. <coughs> Laotian would talk to ground teams and find out what kind of reports they could give us. And because they, they had some front lines between the Royal Oceans and Path of Lao, 
about 40 miles from our base. And so one day we got a report that there had been a bunch of troops that was in this little narrow pass. The, the Karsh Mountains we had over there were much different probably than anything you saw, but a lot like the James Bond movies where you see these vertical things coming out of the water and all that's Karsh. Limestone, long ago formations, lots of caves in them because of the way they've hollowed out. So that was a plus for them in some cases, but if you were taking a truck, you couldn't go over them. You had to go around them. So there was this one place, which actually didn't have a road, but there was a trail where a river came through the narrow patch past cars. And we got a report that there were troops. They gave me coordinates and I said, well, that's right at the, on the trail, right at the bottom of the cars. And I'm thinking, well, they're not there because I can't see them, but we would go ahead and hit these coordinates anyway because sometimes we got ground fire. He said, hey, there was something there. <clears throat> so we get 105s, and I'm going to talk some of my pitch tomorrow night. 105s were designed to take nuclear weapons into Eastern Europe if NATO was ever attacked by Russia. Supersonic could hit targets well with nuclear weapons. They weren't designed to drop iron bombs. So they were adapting over there, and, and there were some problems on the trail because they didn't want to trade a 105 for a truck, so they had them pull out too high, and they are throwing bombs from a long ways away. So I said, get these two 105s. Say, okay, they usually had six, 750 pound bombs each. I want you to hit right at the base, right there by the river, got it marked. And the first guy came in, I think he dropped in the river. So I'm thinking, okay, didn't get much out of that. The second guy hit long, and he hit about, I don't know, four or 500 feet up the side of the karst. I'm thinking, that wasn't what I had in mind either, so I just thought we'd waste the flight. And about four or five days later, we got a report that we'd killed 50 to 60 percent of two companies because they were in the caves and collapsed the caves. So I'm thinking about this on, the, on Christmas Eve, thinking, okay, if the clouds go that way, I'm going to go as far down that road into North Vietnam as I can till I find a piece of mountain against the road. And I will tell the first flight, you know, you're not going to get any trucks, I need the road. And I've been able to do that and then find something else to bottle because going back was not a good option for them in the first place. But if we could have blocked it down there with the weather, we'd have been killing trucks all day. So, But we missed that. But again, the, the real message, and, and you saw this in the truce in February of 67. You know, we got, I've got pictures of North Vietnam, Vietnamese trucks all the roads because they had three or four days then that was free. <clears throat> but you didn't see them normally in the daytime, except in that special case. I found some, I started going across the, the border without clearance um, to, to chase them down because they were parked them alongside the road since the facts weren't coming over there anymore. So I'm giving you maybe more than you're looking for, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's some of the stuff you'd have learned if you'd have been flying with me. Good to know. Thank you. So what did you, how long were you in the military after Thailand? Came home in 67 and I retired in uh, 86. In the, I think about late 87. So I was another 20 years. Okay. Uh, can you run us through a quick highlight of what you did for that time frame? I, I came back to C-141s, Travis, my wife stayed the same spot. And my, my roommate, his wife, they, they lived about five blocks apart, so came right back to the flying squadron. Now I had the experience, I had a lot more confidence in where I'd gone over, so I went through the upgrade program, got to be an aircraft commander. It takes a while, but got to be an aircraft commander. I think I was already an instructor pilot before I left there in May of 1970, so I was there 68 to 70. I had two or three options then. I had. Uh, assignment to AFID, Air Force Institute of Technology, right down the hall, or down the road a little bit. Was here two years, 70 to 72, um, and a master's in astronautical engineering. Um, so I really was a rocket scientist for a while. Um, also, while I was here, we organized at AFID a group to support the POW MIA families. So that was kind of the start of that. and then and did a lot of stuff there so that when the POWs came here to the hospital it was good because a lot more people knew about it than would have before. Uh, 
there wasn't a lot of assignments at that point for, you know, for what I'd just been trained in, and so they weren't sure they were going to find something in that field. So at that point, I said, well, I would kind of like to go back to the academy and be an air, air officer commanding to work directly with cadets to try to pass on part of what I learned. But they ended up finding an assignment for me at Offit, and it was actually a reconnaissance technical wing. They're at the headquarters, but this little bitty office we had was in that wing because they had the powerful computers, the IBM 360-85 back in those days with the, the disks and the punch cards. and This little group that, that I was involved in, and I was ahead of it in 76 before I left, about 20 or 30 people, and uh, mostly engineers, and our job was to make the Mylar tapes with the targeting information to be read into the intercontinental ballistic missiles. So that if they said fire it, our tapes would tell it where to go. And these got changed out about every six months so that the Soviets couldn't figure out which missile was gonna go where. So we had quite a bit to do. Every time there was gonna be one of those revisions, we had to make all these target tapes. They were two-man control items because we we're talking nuclear weapons. So we'd get the tapes made They'd give us the input of what they wanted, and we'd sit there at a desk, and two guys would go through what we saw to try to make sure it was going to do what they'd asked for. A couple times we uncovered a problem or two that uh, was kind of interesting. Uh, but um, did that for a while, and, and like I said, we've, we were there in the building to do the SAC headquarters work, but we are in that wing because they had these ma massive computers at the time. Spent four years there, got a chance in 76 to go back to C-141s. Had to go back to the school down at Altus, Oklahoma at that point because I'd been out for six years and even though I'd been an instructor, so I <laughs> I started the class there on a Wednesday with 11 guys out of, right out of pilot training and me. I think I was a major at that point. <coughs> I'm telling them what a safe airplane the C-141 has been. We started flying them routinely in 65. Here we are in 76, and there's only been six of them lost at that point, and none of them were the airplane's fault. Three of them, the guys flew in the mountains for various circumstances. Um, one had been burned up on the ground because of fast turnaround procedures had been set up to try to get the airplane on the ground, turn around, head back out again as soon as you could, and up in the cord, and they put 220 volts across the fuel cell and burned that one up. And there were a couple telling this story to the guys on <laughs> on Wednesday <laughs> and Saturday two of them crashed. <laughs> so on Monday my credibility was kind of shot with the lieutenant. <laughs> but it was, you know, one came apart in a thunderstorm over England and one got crashed by a not very well qualified crew at Saunders from Greenland that needed to have some more experienced pilots with this brand new aircraft come in. So uh, Anyway, I was a big believer in 141s, ended up going to Travis or to Norton Air Force Base when I finished the school there. I had to go back through the process of coming up to be an aircraft commander and instructor pilot. Moved on up to being a check pilot, which I didn't care much for. I like to teach, but I, we'd had a really rough check pilot in my first squadron. And, and uh, I thought, I don't have enough to kill her instinct to be like he was. And, and so I was a squadron chief of standardization, which meant I could give check pilots to, you know, I had a few guys working for me and gave check rides and, you know, I could check anybody basically in the squadron and, and I got a call one day when I was taking some time off with my father and the ops officer called me and he said, well, we got a new wing commander because we didn't, hadn't have a wing check pilot for a while based on some circumstances. And, and so the ops officer called and said, well, Monday the squadron commander, or the wing commander wants to announce that you're the new wing chief stand about. <laughs> and so that was the first thing I said to him. I said, I don't think I've got enough to kill her instinct for that. <laughs> and he said, well, that's not what he wants. He wants somebody with reputation, somebody who could get us a program going again that hadn't been going for a while. So I was the wing chief of Santa Val for the last year or two. <clears throat> and, oh, there was... I wanted to be a squadron commander. That was what I was working for. At one point, they offered me to be a maintenance squadron commander, which was not what I wanted because they had about a thousand young enlisted guys that were not quite as mature as you needed. But I was single, and in the military airlift command, they generally wanted married squadron commanders. 
Now part of the rationale is you got a lot of guys and about a third of them are across the Pacific at any time. Well, a lot of them have families. Uh, something goes bad at home while they're gone. Some of the wives uh, would be hesitant to maybe get their husband in trouble to put out any information. So they figured, well, if you got a squadron commander's wife who's there saying, hey, if you have any problems, come to me, that's better. But the ops officer could do it. And it turned out we already had one squadron commander who was single, was John Brodak, because he'd been a POW for about seven years. And he was still catching up. It was kind of hard to tell him he ought to be married. <coughs> but they figured they couldn't have two. So suddenly I got an assignment here at War College, which was about a year or two before I needed them. Um, I'd made major very, very early, there were, and so my promotions all come about three years early because of starting early as major. And there was a chance I might have made Colonel Blow the Zone had I been a squadron commander there doing that. You go to war college, you got a bunch of hot lieutenant colonels and such, so uh, that was not the best thing for, for me to have an assignment, but I went to war college, which in itself is a good thing, but it wasn't the right timing. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, Went from there to Wright Patterson, became a. Still got a little bit. No, I'm sorry. I had a uh, um, SPO, SPO director, system program office, and we had a one group that was kind of advanced programs, where you start out with just a few people and you try to get through the first phase, and then if the system's going to go, then they start building a program office. And one of the programs I got there was um, advanced cruise missile which was a stealth cruise missile back in the old days where that was a compartmentalized program, uh, code word. Now I've seen since in the Air Force Times, and, or not the Air Force Magazine, that their annual state of the thing, I've seen my missile back in the back, and so it's been in there and gone, but it was pretty advanced stuff at the time, and uh, uh, it was a DARPA program, Defense Research Projects Agency, and so they had a program manager there. I had me and my engineer and my secretary, and we were working this program. And oh, one week before Christmas, we did the source selection. The three of us sat down, and we had two contractors, Boeing and General Dynamics, and they both had their designs, and we had to make a decision in, I don't know how many billions of dollars that was worth, but that was the three of us sitting around the table. I was somewhat influenced <laughs> by it been been to a meeting by one of the contractors. We'd go out there and they'd brief us on stuff. And we were in this code word briefing and and the, the guy came in with the coffee cart to see if he could give us more coffee. And that kind of influenced me saying, you guys need to have tighter security because you don't have a setup where the guy can walk in with the coffee cart. And, and it turned out the other guys seemed to have the better proposal anyway, but I not eager. So that was one thing, quite a bit of, <coughs> of responsibility. Then I became a joint system program director of a little bigger thing for what was going to be the follow-on of the IFF, Identification Friend and Foe. How can you tell who's out there well beyond visual range? And that was kind of a nightmare. It was a joint services NATO program. Uh, the Europeans, they wanted to get in on the construction of it. The other guys didn't want to get involved, and uh, I finally had a, an army colonel come in working for me. And I forget one time I called someplace, and I wanted to talk to, to the guy who was really supposed to be there. I think it was the army, and the guy ended up hanging up from from on me, who was a major lieutenant colonel. And I thought that's not a bright option because <laughs> I'm going to be calling back. And of course, I got an apology later, but. They didn't want to give up the money. It wasn't something that, you know, it was a DOD program. And sometimes DOD programs, the services don't have anything to do with it because it's just going to take budget for something that's on a project of theirs. <coughs> Although you did need answers of who you were going to identify. One of the best examples is they had two F-4s down our test range out of, you know, whatever the test thing is, just off Florida on the west side. And they're out shooting at a drone. and. Uh, when I'm shot the other one down. I said, hey, you got to be able to tell who's who out there. And of course, once you get a mix up, I mean, if you mess up with two airplanes, when you got 40 or 50 down there fighting each other, 
there was a need for it, but there was not a good answer. And I finally got fed up because I couldn't control the people I had. I had 15 of us working, needed about 50. And I finally just came up. Well, I got overruled one time because I got right pat. The civilian bureaucracy says, okay, I'm in control of all the engineers. I'll decide when you get to have engineers. And, and I had a really good guy working for me who was kind of a key. And suddenly they needed him for something else one time when I ended him. So I wrote a letter to Four Star that says, I'm probably going to get out of the Air Force if I don't go someplace else because I'm, I, I, I can't do the job like that. I was kind of hoping he would say, well, maybe we ought to address that problem. But I think the bureaucracy was something he couldn't bring. So got a chance to go to Air Force Space Division, Los Angeles. Interesting assignment out there. Very few rated officers. In the Air Force, the rated officers get the better assignments. You can work a lot, but if you're not a rated officer, they can bring a rated lieutenant colonel in, and now he's the boss, and whether he has a thing or not. Well, I didn't work as well in the space business, because if you bring some guy in and he, he caused a $500 million error, you don't want too many of those. So it was kind of a different world out there. It was almost all non-rated people, or a few rated, but they were the experts. They'd been working on these things for a long time, and a great general that uh, he, he'd been very early in the space gro program. I really liked him. and uh, oh, GPS was just starting then. We had eight satellites up then, something like that. Um, and I recognized that, you know, I'm. I'm not the brains in this group, and so originally I was, I was there for another one of these beginning program things only in space, but when I got there they said, well, it's moving to, to Albuquerque in two months. And I'd just been to war college and all this, and they said, do you want to go? And I'm saying, no, it'd be three moves in four years, and I really would rather settle here. So they put me as deputy commander of the communication satellite, suppose. We had a defense communication satellite. We had a Millstar was just being developed then, which was going to be a kind of a master thing. Had a NATO satellite communication. So I was satisfied to be the deputy there, and uh, kind of like when I was admin officer. I took care of the paperwork so the colonel could go out and fly. And so I, I ran the stuff, and the, the guy who really knew what was going on, he was the boss. I didn't have any problem with that. And he got to be a general based on on that year, uh, it was well earned, and I got a call one day from, uh, I suppose, the colonel in command of personnel, <coughs> and said that um, you've been selected to be the chief of staff of the space division. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I'm a paperwork guy, or I know how to do it, and and uh, uh, so I moved up to that job, which is kind of a super job, but not a super boss, and. About the time that I got that, we had three generals there. We had a three-star commander, two-star vice commander, and we had a one-star <coughs> over at the launch vehicles program office. The one-star just left, and another one's coming in in six or eight weeks. So I had a delay because I was going to a joint service school for a couple of months. I came back and took over in about May. And about that same week, the vice commander of the Air Force System Command was three-star general here at Wright Pat. <coughs> was out at Vegas flying something and there's some speculation he was flying a Russian MiG because normally generals don't fly without an instructor. So he's on some kind of single seat airplane. Don't know, but he ended up having to eject and uh, and they thought he was fine when I got to him but he'd broken his neck. So now you lost the three star up here. We had our two star, it was General Randolph, one of the first, I think he got to be four star, one of the early black generals. So. He was pulled out suddenly to come up here with the third star to be a deputy here. And so it was General McCartney and me with no other generals and uh, for a couple months, but General McCartney's secretary, Ruth. Between her and I, we could run it when he wasn't there. But uh, I got to go down to a NATO satellite launch because there wasn't another general to send down as a formal representative. And uh, great assignment, great boss, a lot of latitude. Uh, 40 or 50 colonels there on the base, and I could hold sway with, you know, I didn't get in the way of the program managers, but if I wanted to make a point, you know, the general had confidence in me, so it was a great assignment. Then <laughs> I was, one day I get a call from personnel that said, how would you like to be the, well, I put in once to be a uh, air attache. 
I got a call from personnel and says, are you married? And I said, no, you got somebody in mind? And he said, no, but we're looking for married officers to be our attache. He said, I can understand that to a degree. But in Pakistan, you didn't need one. And so they, would you like to be their attache in Pakistan? I said, well, it's not been very high on my list. And, well, how about being the senior DOD officer in Egypt? And so, you know, what's this all about? Well, it turned out in the Air Force, you had a date of return from overseas. And so that gets updated when I came home from Thailand, and then it, you update a little bit, 90 days for my Mac fly. But I have got one of these, I'm a colonel with the date of return from overseas in 1968 and they need a rated officer because their attaches have some kind of little airplane they fly. And so suddenly I was vulnerable for overseas assignment, which was a total shock at that point. It was a shock to the general because he was going to retire in about six months and he didn't want to break into the chief of staff. And I had a lady friend that had a Jewish background and I thought, I'm not sure how I could take her into one of the Muslim countries. Would that be any kind of a hassle? And the general saying, well, you know, you could put in for retirement now and don't have to retire for a year because that would get me past the, the block that he was most interested in. And I thought, well, I thought about going back to Pentagon because she, she was good in computers and I thought, you know, she could maybe, we worked at IBM some little bit together after I retired, or not IBM, uh, no, one of the companies, I uh, can't think of right now. So put in my papers and within a week or two or three or whatever, the Challenger exploded on takeoff out of out of uh, Cape Canaveral, and we had launch facilities there. And so my general, who was one of the wisest guys in the space program in America, was selected to go down and run the Kennedy Space Center for three years until he retired, and then they hired him for another two years. So now suddenly he's gone. I got to break in a new three-star, and and that got me out of the service in February of 1987 with not quite 24 years commission service and four years of the academy that didn't count for anything. Uh, no time. Yeah, that's about all the time we have, and thank you, that was an amazing story. Well, you know, kind of got somebody else's time there probably, but, well, got a lot of background, and I, I did a lot of research here at War College, so part of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow night is I know a lot about what went over there, and, and so I'm hoping to educate a lot of the guys here because most of them did not know. Uh, the guys on our flight line, they didn't know what we were doing. I always assumed they did because our planes went off and they didn't come back sometimes. And so <coughs> over the last 20 years, it's been trying to educate guys like you see here on how important what they were doing was, even if they didn't know it at the time. Wow. Well, I'm very thankful for what you're doing. And, <laughs> okay. and uh, thank you uh, for doing this interview. And Thank you for your service. Okay, sorry. Take too much of your no, time. No, no, you're fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, appreciate it.